I'm very pleased now to call our third speaker, Claudia Lozano. Claudia is a sociologist and a lecturer in the Latin American studies in the Free University of Berlin. She's also a guest lecturer in humanities and educational sciences in the National University of La Plata. Claudia is going to speak to us on feeling responsible for the good life on earth, the everyday construction of common cultural goods in the Andes. Thank you very much, Claudia. Thank you, Marie-Terre. Albert, she was connected to me by uh, Ilse Schimfergen, who is directing an institute in Berlin called Paulo Freire Institute. And oh, I would take this because I, oh, it is on. Oh. Um, and I'm a sociologist working since years as a, a oral history and social anthropologist in Argentina, in the Andean region of Argentina. And, uh, well, this is not my... <laughs> <laughs> and I came to in contact with uh, cultural heritage because in 2003, this region was declared. Um, I'm not used to this kind, to uh, windows, so... Okay, this is Argentina, and I work in this region. This is in the border region of uh, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. Jujuy is called the province. And uh, the World Heritage Site is all around this place. This is the Quebrada de Humahuaca. And I have been living and working there as an anthropologist, that's the church. Um, from 1993 until 1997, and I wrote my dissertation on cultural practice and religious change in this area. At the time I worked there, there was no cultural heritage in view, there was no idea. And uh, after the big crisis in Argentina, which was very related to the new model of new liberal development in the country, uh, the idea of world cultural heritage came to this place because politicians should do something to make people feel happy and to make people see that they were doing something for them because nobody will believe in politics and nobody would believe in development at that time in Argentina. So I was very interested in 2008 to make another uh, 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 stay in the region to see what happens after World Cultural Heritage, or the region was declared as part of the World Cultural Heritage. That's one of the streets. I used to work in this, in this uh, uh, church, which is a Protestant church in a region which is Catholic. That's the, the landscape. That's the house where I used to live and that was made by myself also because we used to work together. And I'm going to talk about architecture and building uh, barrios or neighborhood. That's the last uh, way of constructing spaces in the region. And that's what I am going to criticize because it is changing the whole thing. That are the new hotels. And this the, is the spectacular view that is, go, is being sailed to tourism. Well, I have to read because I don't feel that fluent in English. Um, in her article on missions and visions of sustainability discourses in heritage studies, Marie Therese Albert sustains that the existence of so many different and conflicting conceptualizations of sustainability results in heritage related activities that are anything but sustainable. In her view, world heritage sites are at risk of complete destruction because tourist companies and a growing number of travelers have transformed them into a valuable marketable product and a profitable business at global scale. 
In front of this situation, she asks if it is that the perception of the importance of world heritage has changed over the last four decades, or that the concept of environmental, social, and cultural sustainable de development have altered in a way that deterioration not only emanates out of modernization processes, but also in terms of a wide range paradigm shift within society itself. She makes a strong argument as she criticized the populist implementation of the World Heritage Convention at the preponderance of commercial interest. Bearing that in mind, I will offer a concrete example of contemporary uses of architectural concepts and techniques of indigenous cultures from the past in the construction of social spaces in Andean localities in the province of Jujuy in Argentina. Along the national and global architecture, indigenous architecture is also guided by ideas of consumption as a constructive and destructive process, but they differ in substantial way, sorry, differ in substantial ways to one another. From the cognitive technical perspective, their differences can be conceptualized in terms of scale, its organization in relation to topographic shapes of the ground and its materials. But as important as this are there is an emotional and ethical dimension that seems that stems from the anxieties and fears awakened by imbalances, environmental damages caused by unregulated extractions that could threaten the continuity of fruitful exchanges between human beings and nature. Specifically, the inscription of the Quebrada de Humahuaca in Argentina as part of the world cultural heritage is based, among other aspects, on a strong regulative framework, including the national constitution, national and provincial laws, decrees and resolutions that protect both cultural and natural heritage and promote the use of local knowledge and techniques. As I will show in the next paragraphs, the problem is complex and interesting at the same time. Supranational declarations such as the UNESCO World Heritage and national laws provide legal support to the claims of local indigenous communities against land sales, extractivism, environmental damages, commercial use of, moment, of monuments, etc., from the distant frontiers to the centers of political and economical power. Nevertheless, they promote demands of recognitions of indigenous and new cross-border groups, as well as a, political, a politic of distribution and inclusion to the global capitalistic market. And that's the big problem, this contradiction between taking care of the cultural heritage on the one hand and on old and ancient techniques and traditional knowledge, and on the other hand, the openness to the global markets. Unlike other regions of Argentina, the mountain's landscape its topography is not outside the history, but rather defines an aesthetic of power. Not only does it outline the social environment, but it also supplies the raw material, earth, water, cactus, and canes, with which to build local reduced scale architecture. And that makes a difference, the scale. This distinguishing feature of local architecture is precisely the fortuitous way in which it is projected into the landscape, closely, fo closely following the contours of the land, creating imposing spaces and planes. In a landscape which it does not dominate, the population of the high plateau uses materials to create an architecture that is keeping with the environment. As suggested by the architect Nicolini, the inhabitants of the Quebrada and the Puna builds us through, they are creating one more feature of the landscape, not a monument. In this respect, in the 1980s, and especially since the Quebrada de Humahuaca was declared a cultural landscape and world heritage site in 2003, a form of literature has sprung up that links landscape, environment, land, and public works to disputes about the local economic development model and the power of the state to regulate the social space through laws and funding. In these works, the environment and its appreciations in terms of a cultural landscape constitute a powerful cultural mechanism by which to claim support in order to sustain traditional activities, 
agriculture, livestock, farming, textiles, pottery, medicine, architecture, on a small scale. They also lend way to public criticism of a road infrastructure modernization projects aimed at increasing tourism and adding mineral extraction through the establishment of large-scale mining projects. These later activities and the migration from the countryside to mining and urban centers, both inside and outside the province, have formed part of the social and economic history of the Andean High Plateau in Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Peru, since the 16th century. I am interested particularly in the weight carried currently by the notions of cultural landscape and the ability that different local groups and national and cross-border bodies believe it to have to attract and transform values and conditions imposed by the states and by the market. The Quebrada is considered exceptional as a corridor, facilitating mobility of persons, ideas, and output between different ecological or environmental tiers and playing lost to small-scale architecture ensembles or landscapes from different periods of human history, especially as they become vulnerable to the impact of irreversible change. The conventions view large-scale projects from the modernization of public or private infrastructure, rapid urban and tourist development, changes in use of land and forms of ownership of land, lending to accelerate the deterioration of the local landscape landscape as a threat. I shall start with two examples, I just will concentrate on one, of the limitations of state legislations. First, I shall focus on land distribution programs and those that promote self bills on the outskirts of the town of Umawaka. I will go and show you how it works. In 1993, in addition to the discussion over the history and the culture of the village, is something very important, the local elite were debating what to do with the migrants that arrive in town having been displaced from mining towns and rural areas. In the meantime, the residents of the district of Santa Barbara, where I was living, were building houses and a district community center. The urban planning of the district was the result of a mapping and parceling out of hillsides into lots 10 meters wide by 30 deep by the municipal authorities. Initially, the residents of the barrio built their houses with local materials. They would collect mud, stones, canes from the hillsides and from the river bed, which they used to make mud bricks to build single-story houses with straw and mud roofs. The reorganization of social space through issuing deeds to land, self-building, and the rapid construction of local infrastructure throughout the country was directly linked to the decentralization of administration and the transfer of power to the provinces and municipalities, along with the privatization of public services associated with the neoliberal model of development and modernization. The speed with which changes were implemented unleashes fierce competition for control of the founts and supplies made available for the construction of the barrio. In order to maintain or improve their electoral chances, candidates and political municipal officials had to prove that they were managing the correlation between local demand for materials and the availability of home building programs. I'll show you here. That is the home building programs. Um, efficiently. How efficiently this was managed was perceived in terms of how many buildings had gone up in the barriers, the distribution of construction materials, and the supply of basic public services, electricity, water. The management of this was decentralized. The building work was privatized and control returned to the public domain. However, the planning and technical execution of the work and the materials used were those deemed adequate by the dislocalized functional architectural standards and cost-benefit ratio typical of large building contractors. At any rate, 
decentralization made local life more complicated because it changes the way social space was managed. It created new actors, adding to the numbers, non-governmental organizations and private business. And it changes the notion of self-building and public works, initially neighborhood networks responsible for communal works known as mingas lend continuity to the principle whereby buildings blended into the landscape. But the neighborhood urban plan no longer appeared random, but rather displayed the characteristic of a centralized urban plan dropped up by the municipal authorities. Similarly, work on communal projects was influenced by the action of private business operating in the area, particularly during the run-up to elections when public funds flows out continuously. Business will flock to the area and employ the men to build schools and health centers in areas where the outgoing candidate hoped to be returned. That's called clientelism in Argentina. This reduced, and you find phenomena like that in the whole Latin America and the whole continent. This reduced the commitment to the work and that of the residents of the community. As the years went on, houses, houses and the community center blended in less and less with the landscape as increasingly they displayed the marked competition between leaders, candidates from political parties and private business for founds and materials that the municipal, provincial and national governments handed out to the municipalities. To summarize, self-building may be nothing new. It is a historical practice, but towards the end of the 2008, this practice took a new direction and became hybrid to exposing the different architectural concepts in the region. On the one hand, shapes, materials, and the aesthetic of indigenous powers acting to and celebratory of the generative powers of the mountains landscapes. On the other, the changes brought about by the projects and the key actors of modernizations and the delocalized and standardized ways, standardized ways in which they understand space and the building of social architecture on the cheap for the poor people. Within a framework where, whereby social spaces are built from a purely functional perspective, social spaces are perceived through the media as external, dramatically opposes to that of metropolitan architecture. Nonetheless, in 2008, and even more so in 2015, I was there in Mar on March, when I visited the region, the municipality was then in charge of a new elite of professionals who were interested in taking development and investment in a new direction, similar to how private business is run. Initially, people were divided as to whether large-scale roads, tourism, and mining were preferable or whether they were opposed to large-scale projects and preferred small-scale undertakings. Competition and building momentum had not yet ceased, and yet both camps had undergone change with a newfound respect to the environment and an appreciation of the landscape and cultural identity. Official documents on the process that rendered the Quebrada a World Heritage Site highlight that the initiative undertaken by Governor Ferner was motivated by the mobilization of local professionals from the Instituto Nacional de Tecnología Agropecuaria, National Institute for Agricultural and Livestock Farming, and teachers who opposed the construction of an electrical conduit by multinationals. This group got in touch with members of the national parliament and with UNESCO officials who in 2001 visited the region and persuaded the authorities of two things. Firstly, to begin proceeding to inscribe the area and secondly, to ask the Federal Council for Investment, Consejo Federal de Inversiones, to carry out the feasibility the feasibility study, the result of both of these courses of action had a significant impact on local political rhetoric. And in 2001, within the general context of awakening of all the political parties, they began to listen to the demands of local environmentalist and protectionist movements and voices. And I will close, yes. This environmentalist and protectionist movements did not phrase their demands in terms of cultural differences or 
contemporary aspects of indigenous cultures in the region. Rather, they criticized the local model of investment and infrastructure that favored the interests of external investors, big multinationals who hope to sell electricity to Bolivia. Studies highlight the fragmented nature, and that's a big problem, of indigenous organizations, and that these were not included in talks others with the movements or with officials until quite late in the process. UNESCO recommendations made three key points. Develop a strategic management plan, carry out studies to monitor water levels in the river system, and encourage participation with a view to formulating a new application that will include the Camino del Inca in the World Heritage List. Here, the natural environment appears as a complicated force. While it is clear that in the local public arena, the environment and its indigenous populations reshape their image and overcome their differences thanks to the world heritage status because of the cultural value it brought to their otherness, neither the studies I have quoted nor neighbors expected the inscription to have enough strength to force politicians to meet local needs and demands. Quite the opposite. All were convinced that the conciliatory language of the politician had more to do with internal, provincial, and national political alliances than the, than the, demands, of, and the demands of international organizations and pressures from external investors. <laughs>